This is an instruction course on socket anomalies, all about socket anomalies and management. Uh, we have a galaxy of speakers. Dr. Vikas Menon, who is a chief consultant in Oculoplasty at Arvindai Hospital, Madurai, Ch uh, Chennai. Uh, Dr. Colonel Nitin Vichare, who is the head of the Department of Ophthalmology at uh, Pune in the Command Hospital. And uh, Dr. Himika Gupta will join us shortly. And she is a consultant at both uh, SRCC Mumbai and also at her cl private clinic. She works exclusively in oculoplasty and manages a lot of tumors. And I also be the one of the speakers. I'm Dr. Ramesh Murthy, I practice in Pune. And we have a huge volume of socket uh, cases which we manage. I will now request uh, Dr. Vikas Menon to come and speak on his topic. He's going to tell us all about surgeries, evisceration, inoculation, all the innovations in the surgical techniques. This will be a very useful talk for everyone. Dr. Ramesh, thank you so much for having me with you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Ramesh was my teacher at LV Prasad. So uh, I'll be talking about evisceration, the inoculation, and uh, the techniques that we follow these days. Basically, inoculation and evisceration are destructive surgeries, and uh, they are one of the extreme surgeries that we as oculoplastic people have to do sometimes. Uh, but being a surgeon for these uh, destructive surgeries, we have to be very conscious of the fact that these surgeries can have a huge psychological impact on these patients. And uh, our aim is always to provide them a good cosmesis as much as possible, near normal, with the good, uh, and we have to team up with a good ocularist and uh, give them a good prosthesis so that they continue to have a normal life subsequently even after going through this kind of uh, experience in life. So that's up to us, how well we perform our surgeries that will actually dictate how their l subsequent social life also goes in some to some extent. For us it's a one hour surgery, for them it's a matter of life. So that becomes very important for us to see that each step of our surgery is performed meticulously and uh, we do look into it not as a routine procedure, but as something which is which will be of great value to the patient's life. The goals of surgery are two. Number one is to safely remove the diseased eye. If we are dealing with a tumor, we don't want to spill over the tumor in the orbit and spread it further and make life worse for the patient. And to create a healthy socket which can receive a good prosthesis subsequently. Enucleation implies that we remove the eyeball completely along with a segment of the optic nerve. The indications for enucleation in today's time are these three. Either it's a very bad trauma where the globe is unsalvageable. Number two, if it's an intraocular tumor, that's one of the absolute indications for enucleation. And number three, if we have a situation where the thysical globe is so small that uh, pra it's practically impossible to do an evisceration. So what we follow these days as a, a standard technique for enucleation is a myoconjunctival enucleation. So I will take you through the steps of this technique through the video and you see the first step is a 360 degree conjunctival peritomy and then you use a tenotomy scissor to bluntly separate the tenons capsule from the globe. Then you hook all the four recti one by one. So like in this uh, step you see that the inferior rectus is hooked and then you pass a 4-0 traction suture near the insertion of the inferior rect uh, of the rectus muscle whichever you have tagged with and then you apply some traction to that traction suture that's 4 o silk and about 5 to 6 millimeter away from that first suture you take a 6 o vicryl bite that's like you know uh, it's a it's a if it's a long thread you just cut it into two and you you maintain two ends of the thread equally equal lengths of the thread uh, you maintain and then you divide the muscle between these two bites that you have taken one vicryl and the silk suture similarly you repeat this step for all the recti usually we begin with the medial rectus and then we proceed along medial rectus inferior rectus lateral rectus and come towards the superior rectus because uh, that's the based on the distance of the insertion of the recti from the limbus. 
so once we have uh, passed both these types of sutures one traction suture four of silk and then the six of vicryl which is through actually the belly of the uh, rectus muscle we then proceed on to cut the oblique muscle superior oblique and then this is inferior oblique for inferior oblique uh, we prefer to use a bipolar cautery because it's a more vascular muscle you don't need to really tag or pass sutures through obliques and then you pass your tenotomy scissor cut the optic nerve preferably in one go look at this from a lateral end so you reach the apex of the orbit if you want a, a long optic nerve stump and then you withdraw it slightly and uh, you cut the optic nerve stump in one go once the globe is removed you have the space for implant and then you put your i use a pmma implant so you put that pmma implant in the space that is created between the posterior tenons layer so that's basically the intraconal space of the orbit where you put your implant and once your implant which is of adequate size is sitting comfortably there it should not be too big or neither should be too small uh, then you pass uh, close the posterior tenons layer in with 6o vicryl and then the 6o vicryl sutures which were attached to the stumps of the or the bellies of the recti muscle they those sutures are passed or taken out through the conjunctiva exteriorized on the conjunctiva so on all these sides we've taken out those sutures but left them untied at this stage after that the anterior tenons is closed and the conjunctiva is closed in a continuous fashion so all these three layers are closed separately and very meticulously posterior tenons after putting the implant first posterior tenons then you take the muscles and tie them to the conjunctiva near the fornices and then you come to close the anterior tenons and the conjunctiva so once all the layers are closed in the end then you tie those those sutures which are actually the myoconjunctival sutures so these sutures are the ones that attach the muscle stumps to the conjunctiva so the idea is that when the muscle moves that fornix will move because that part of conjunctiva will be pulled by that particular muscle belly when there is a movement and that will pull the ultimately that will create a space in which the prosthesis will also move so with this technique uh, we are able to get a uh, movement which is almost uh, identical to using porous implants with the scleral grafts and all those things uh, and there was a randomized control trial which has been published already so with a proper myoconjunctival technique and with a good sized porous uh, this non porous implant which is very cheap compared to a porous implant and also having much less complication rate you are able to get good motility now we turn our eyes to the evisceration so evisceration is the second part of the uh, destructive surgery that we do evisceration was first performed in 1870s 17 by beers for a surgery which was complicated by expulsive now the indications in present times are a painful or a disfigured non seeing eye that's the number one patients are coming with a disfigured non seeing eye uh, mainly for cosmesis and uh, if it's painful then all the more reason for them to undergo this procedure second is infections endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis cases where the risk of spread of infection to cavernous sinus is there number third thysis bulbi which is not so severe as i showed earlier in which uh, you had to do an enucleation but even in nowadays with a modified techniques we are able to take care of many of these thysis bulbi patients which earlier we were subjecting to enucleation but now with the recent modifications in technique we are able to manage putting a good sized implant even with evisceration so that thysis bulbi is currently an indication not for enucleation many of these cases can be managed by evisceration staphylomatous globes basically again the reason here is uh, cosmesis patients uh, especially young patients are very conscious for their looks and they want some relief from the that disfiguring disfigured eye where you can use evisceration and end stage glaucoma again falls into sort of a painful blind eye now the advantages of evisceration over enucleation you have to understand why where and why you would prefer any evisceration evisceration is less time consuming it is a faster procedure it requires no orbital tissue or muscle dissection it requires less disturbance of normal orbital anatomy there is lesser incidence of late onset fat atrophy or contracted socket and overall you get a better orbital volume and better processes motility because your 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 manipulation in the orbit is much less compared to enucleation and contraindications are a few absolute contraindication always remember if you have any doubt of an intraocular malignancy even if it's not established even a subtle doubt of malignancy please don't do evisceration always subject the patient for enucleation 
the relative contraindications are penetrating tra trauma very bad penetrating trauma where enucleation is preferred just to avoid the risk of sympathetic ophthalmitis which is very very rare extremely rare but still uh, there is slight advantage of doing enucleation in those cases and pre-existing nystagmus because in those cases if, if you do an evisceration and you leave the muscles and the sclera intact sometimes even with prosthesis these patients can keep on having nystagmus afterwards so th those cases enucleation may be preferred now standard evisceration technique where we remove the contents of the globe and we put an implant we we will see a slight modification of that subsequently but the problems with standard evisceration techniques were that only a small sized implant could be placed in the scleral shell once you've taken out all the contents of the sclera and uh, many a times you would have to close the wound under tension and that would lead to more of post-op pain and more chances of implant exposure so deal with to deal to deal with all these problems there is a uh, there is a modification which is now pretty much established uh, in literature and that's called four petal evisceration there are various modifications each surgeon has their own way of further modifying this four petal evisceration so you begin in the same way as any other standard evisceration that you do a 360 degree conjunctival peritomy and then you make a stab incision along the limbus and you excise the corneal button once cornea is removed then you go in with a scoop you take out all the uveal tissue and then you clean the scleral shell with absolute alcohol which is then rinsed with saline up to this part it's all like a standard evisceration now here comes the difference so you take your 11 number blade and you make radial sclerotomies so the sclera is actually divided into four parts those are called four petals so in between the muscles so you go from anterior point of the scleral opening to posterior to the optic nerve and then in the last part you also remove the optic nerve from those scleral petals so you basically kind of detaching the optic nerve from the scleral shell making an incision all around the optic nerve so you're not exactly cutting the optic nerve but you're going around the optic nerve and you're making incision in the sclera so that the optic nerve detaches from the scleral shell and falls behind once that is done properly you get a good amount of space then you can even put a larger implant once that larger implant goes in then you can seal the uh, your scleral opening you can close it uh, with interrupted sutures so you may opt for a complete uh, uh, sclerotomy that's a radial incision going from the anterior most part of the sclera back to the optic nerve insertion or you may make it a partial uh, incision depending upon the size of the uh, socket size of the eyeball that you're dealing with once that is done closure is in layers uh, tenons and conjunctiva and then you place a proper conformer and that ends your surgery so with this uh, you can actually place a larger sized implant your wound closure is much relaxed it's not under tension and there are much less chances of pain and much less uh, wound uh, implant exposure post-op care is basically you give systemic antibiotic anti-inflammatory drugs topical antibiotic steroid drops and then taper them off some of the complications of evisceration and enucleation which have gone significantly down now with these modifications that i just showed you but still you have to keep those in mind bleeding bleeding is probably one of the most common reasons uh, which can ultimately lead to implant exposure because it creates a lot of pressure in the socket and uh, somehow there was a study recently which showed that you know bleeding came out as one of the most significant factors intra-op bleeding so you should try to first control the bleeding ensure a proper hemostasis and then go in with your implant rather than quickly trying to just finish off the surgery implant exposure is a fairly common uh, problem uh, not a fairly common sorry it's an uncommon problem nowadays and there are various ways to deal with it you may have to change the implant sometimes or you may have to put a scleral graft especially if it's a porous implant and then uh, uh, sympathetic ophthalmia fortunately is very very rare with current uh, techniques and with the uh, availability of good quality steroids deep supratarsal sulcus is one problem but if you place a good size implant again that is also eliminated and some patients may have persistent pain pyogenic granulomas again those are uh, manageable issues not very severe so to conclude i would just like to say that enucleation is actually a beginning of a long relationship between you and your patient and he will be coming to you or he or she will be coming to you recurrent over their lifetimes every few months and it just creates a good bond so you you be good to these patients 
because they are not going to be like you know one of those patients like cataract surgery patients where you've done a good job and they are happy and they go up so it's a long relationship so do it well and it's up to us to create a good socket so that they can uh, lead a normal life subsequently thank you very much thank you dr vikas uh, are there any questions from the audience any questions Doctor, because one important question: uh, What suture do you routinely use for these surgeries? What suture do you use? For which surgeries? All these six of vicrin. Six of vicrin. And what about the tarsography that you perform at the end? Even for that, uh, I use six of vicrin only. And what what is the time when you remove the tarsography suture? Tarsography suture usually can be removed after one week. Our next speaker is Dr. Salil uh, Sir, who is a professor at Medical College Calcutta, and he's going to speak on silicon plate for upper lid reconstruction. Sir, this is a keynote lecture. Uh, respected chairperson and uh, co-instructor and my colleagues here. So my talk is the Nobel silicon plate for replacement of tarsal plate in upper lid reconstruction. No financial interest. Large upper eyelid tumor is always challenged to ocular plastic surgeon. It needs a removal of the tumor followed by replacement of tarsal plate and subsequently reconstruction of the upper eyelid. Often it is life-saving, vision-saving, restoration of normal anatomy and achieving stability, motility, functionality and effective cosmesis. It needs two-stage cutler beard procedure. Without tarsal replacement, there is an inadequate stability, sinkage of the lead, entropian or ectropian may occur. So our study, aim of the study is to evert the efficacy, long-term follow-up, complication, recurrence and function and cosmetic outcome of upper lid reconstruction with total or subtotal replacement of tarsal plate by using novel silicon plate. So this is a prospective non-competitive interventional case study over 30 cases over three years. So now ca first come to a conventional tarsal plate replacement by auricular cartilage. This is a large upper eyelid tumor which is infested with maggot. This is a live maggot is there this tumor associated with the secondary infection. To first remove the maggot by ether and tarpentin oil and systemic antibiotic to cover the secondary infection of the tumor. This is a live maggot which is moving all around the cornea and the soft tissue is there. And this is a poverty, old age, family ignorance, negligence leads to this condition. So first to dressing the patient very carefully regularly with the normal sign and uh, betadine then the patient fixed for operation now we apply the cartilage beard procedure the rectangular skin incision is given four millimeter all away from the lead margin with the fusion control section to prevent the recurrence of the disease and now the tumor is removed gradually to make the defect a rectangular when you create a defect in a rectangular manner you should fit the rectangular defect with the advancement rectangular flap from the lower lid now 100 percent defect should be covered by ar ar architectural support previously we did a harvesting auricular cartilage from the back of the ear pinna vertical skin incision made over the back of the ear pinna cartilage is harvested from the ear pinna it's 30 millimeter length and a six millimeter central wide. But this cartilage has got a no bent and it has an irregular bent is that. That is the disadvantage we have. We have done this 2013 to 2018 is continuously harvesting auricular. We are exhausted. When the patient have a two, three patients are there, it is difficult to do a long duration surgery. Now the advancement flap split it into posterior anterior lamina. The posterior lamina advanced uh, consists of a conjunctiva and capsulopalpebral ligament 
and upper lid again dissected into anterior and posterior lamina the posterior lamina consisting of conjunctiva tus uh, lps aponeuses and the tarsal uh, apon and the orbital plate and this posterior lamina both upper lid are uh, lower lid joint to make the posterior lamina bay on which the auricular cartilage is being fixed this area we are observe for the long day innovate a newer material to replace over this area now it is covered by anterior flap of the both lid second stage after two and a half months convexity downwards incision and the id hook is id repositor pass convexity downwards incision made and the lid is separated upper lid creation is done with a double arm suture to prevent the suture related complication so not should be outside the skin to prevent the corneal complication and the raw edge of the advancement flap sutured with the raw edge of the hammock flap thus inferior fornix is formed always check the inferior fornix which is formed or not because from this inferior fornix the advancement face flap is come this is a post operative phase of the patient look the appearance glute closer good upliftment patient is highly satisfied this paper is published and uh, presented in r1 2015 and published in the international journal also and we have a best video award the 2020 in gurgaon in general segment now this is a special case again there is a large tumor this is really challenging there is a minimal tissue left mri shows there is no orbital inflammation is entirely in the lid so very little little tissue left to do a reconstruction we can do challenge to this reconstruction upper eyelid reconstruction with architectural support almost total upper eyelid is resected more than 100% defect is created when the 100% defect is created more than 100 120% defect is created so uh, only cartilage beard is not possible so there must be additional uh, rotational flap so the the advanced plant flap is created from the lower lid again the same fashion which it's uh, split it into anterior and posterior lamina the here the silicon plate is silicon plate is applied over the posterior lamina bay which is fixed to the post five zero polyglycan suture to prevent the migration of this plate now the anterior lamina is closed but here in the lateral area still there is a gap so the central part is covered by a cartilage or bridge flap and the lateral part which is covered by the rotational flap upper lid tangential rotational flap to cover up the both the gap and uh, this is a tangential flap rotational flap with kanya uh, bridge flap is perform this is a case of amniotic manoma now see the central part this is the tumor where is there and tumor is removed after two month patient have a metastasis and died we have no scope to do a second side surgery now now this is a novel silicone plate we applied in this patient again again upper eyelid tumor auricular cartilage is harvested we are exhausted so try to find a newer way because it is a long duration surgery it has got a second surge surgery lots of complication is there uh, auricular cartilage harvesting is difficult sometimes maybe perforation sometimes the cartilage may break skin perforation skill surgeon require good assistant require so i think lots of thing but change our mind it's a long duration surgery second side surgery harvesting ear cartilage is difficult sometimes break of the cartilage perforation skin needs good assistant so i th- i myself is it possible to do a shorter duration surgery is it possible to do a single side surgery 
can artificial tarsal plate be applicable can silicon be the ideal metal for yet e silicon breast prosthesis appear in the breast carcinoma silicon rod uh, in a tarsal frontal sling but why not this tarsal silicon plate used as a tarsal plate replacement then i applied clinical ethical comedy clearance has been given by the medical college calcutta history of tarsal plate replacement 1978 putterman tarsis by nirmal 2001 achilles tendon by hallman 2005 autogenous nasal cartilage by yakub in 1997 dona sclera and facilitator subsequently 2018 we first introduced a silicon plate this is not available in the market commercial available in the market we obtained from 279 retinal buckle the central group is 2.5 mm and the periphery is 3 mm total is 8 mm the length is 8 mm silicon is a elastomer composed of a polymer silicon with the carbon dioxide with a liquefied gel solidified gel that is the material it is not that retinal buckle used for the silicon plate this is a specification we made it a silicon plate now we apply a clinical application of the silicon plate this is a large apile tumor again we did the same fashion 4 mm away from the cancer zone rectangular defect is created dissection very meticulously and again the advancement flap from the lower lid again the lower lid advanced plate splitted into anterior and posterior lamina again the posterior lamina the both the lid joint to make the posterior lamina bay where this new implant is been fixed silicon plate for number of hole is there our object is that the ramification of the vessel from anterior lamina to posterior lamina got a, a vessel uh, tissue is intervened it may be a screw effect additionally of that it is fixed with a 5 zero polyglactin suture this is a silicon plate which is made it commercially by our laboratory our hospital and it is an anterior lamina joint with the both the anterior lamina the upper and lower lid second stage we reduces the time is six week then we try uh, latest by two week so we cut out shut down the second stage incision is given with the unconvexity downward incision this is a preoperative picture this is a auricular plate versus silicon plate comparative study we did with and we saw it the silicon plate is a better cosmetic appearance in a 6 month follow up risk of transmission of communicable disease in less in silicon plate group silicon is an inert non reacting tissue tested metal thus eliminate the possibility of craft rejection does we think the silicon plate may be the best of material in future general lead reconstruction surgery so we get a best paper award in dos presented in us arvo published in indian journal of ophthalmology this year this is the first 20 article we got it this is a comparative study between silicon plate versus auricular cartilage auricular cartilage harvesting time is longer procedure is longer it's a very short duration surgery and the aesthetic appearance is much better than the auricular cartilage because auricular cartilage the number of bent is there and the curvature is not similar to the curvature of the lid which is silicon plate has got this is a specification of artificial tarsal plate 30 mm length elliptical in shape 6 mm central wide 30 degree angulation from the base material is silicon 0.7 mm thickness multiple hole is there and the weight is 80 to 100 mg that depends on the length of the silicon plate this is a schematic diagram we given to the engineer for manufacturing of the artificial tarsal plate the material is liquefied rubber material silicon so comes your conclusion silicon is an inert non reacting tissue tested material thus eliminating the possibility of craft rejection it is elastic pliable and architecture is stable it is available in desired measurement less chance of disease transmission it is cost effective 
Thus, silicon plate transfer excellent for functional cosmetic result and ideal material for the future general tarsal replacement surgery. This smile is my award. Thank you. If I have any question, you can ask me. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Any questions from the audience? No question. That means hundred percent acceptance. Sir, what is the risk of extrusion? Risk of extrusion. Actually, if you made the specification correctly, chance of extrusion is not. When you first made this uh, plate, if it is thicker, chance of extrusion is good. Otherwise, it is not extruded. If you made the specification correctly, because we made, it's still not marketed. We are, st we are doing, um, made in our resident in our uh, hospital. And it is also sterilized by our resident. Then we uh, apply it. But still it is not marketed, because still we got a patent and copyright. And we give to the uh, commercial people, they will be marketed. Then it will be applicable. Chances of re uh, execution is less. Uh, since the posterior area or the posterior surface is only the thin conjunctiva. No, no, no. Con it's not so a conjunctiva. Does, does it there is a necrosis? No, 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 no. It's not conjunctiva. When the when the upper lid def defect is created, the posterior lamina of the upper lid consisting of conjunctiva, aponeosal elphase, and orbital septum. If you split in the gray line, or uh, orbital septum in the anterior part, we deliberately, when you split, and the or orbital septum is the top structure, which will cover the square area of the upper lid defect. You understand my point? So chances of extrusion is less. That we, first one of the cases extruded that I feel it, what is the problem? Yes, if it is conjunctive, it will be extruded. So that we make an extra potential structural place, that is the orbital septum, it's a much tough structure which is shown to the capsule ligament and conjunctive bundle the lower lid. But the square defect is covered by the orbital septum. Chance of extrusion less. Even the silicon plate, the edge is rounded, not yes. sharp edges. Yes. Any question, anybody? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Now the next topic is choosing the right implant. Uh, the presenter was Dr. Simadas, but unfortunately she could not make it today. So it is very important to understand what kind of implant we want to put in enucleation and evisceration. So the purpose of this orbital implant is to replace the lost orbital volume, to give as good a cosmetics as, as possible to match the other eye, to eliminate problems like superior sulcus deformity and inophthalmos, and also to maximize the process's motility. So when you look at the evolution of orbital implants, we've got these mules implanted hollow glass spheres, which are no longer in use. Then we have got the biointegrable implants and the expandable implants. The ideal orbital implant should be one which will restore the orbital volume completely. It allows motility of the processes. There is no exposure or migration. And in children, it should stimulate the orbital growth. So there are three questions which come into mind. What should we implant? What material? What size should we implant? And where should we implant? Now what to implant? So the most common material that we use are the PMM and the acrylic. Now these two uh, materials are very inert. They are smooth, they are non-porous. Implantation is easy. There are different sizes and the biggest advantage is there is reduced infection and therefore reduced chance of extrusion of the implant. So PMM is still the most widely used implant in India and it is very, very popular among all the oculoplasty surgeons. The drawbacks you may occasionally have is of implant exposure, but that is when we have very tight closure which we have done. And implant migration can happen because the, the implant will slowly start to migrate downwards because it's a very smooth implant. Now motility can be achieved if we can do a myoconjunctival technique of, of enucleation where the implant is actually attached to the fornices through the muscles and therefore in the movements of the uh, implant will be transmitted to the processes. So when the lateral rectus contracts, the eye will move outwards and when the, when the middle rectus contracts, the eye will move inwards. Now pegging is not usually planned in children uh, and implantation in children is very difficult using a pegging and also affordability is a big problem 
and hence PMM still becomes the best choice of an implant. So that is about the non-integrated implants. Now let's talk a little bit about the bio-integrated implants. Now the bio-integrated implants are the ones in which the vascularization is going to happen inside the tissue and because of this there will be better movement of the implant but the only way you can actually improve the motility is by doing a pegging. Now what is pegging? Pegging is placing a small peg in front of the implant to which this process is very firmly attached. So there are two materials which can be used for this bio-integrated implants, the porous polyethylene and the hydroxyapatite. Now hydroxyapatite which is usually coming from the uh, C uh, is difficult to insert and it is we have a difficulty in attaching the extraocular muscles because it's very brittle if you have ever used it it can actually crack many a times. It has also got a very rough surface and it will cause a drag on the tenons and the conjunctiva. So we need to ideally wrap it up in different materials like sclera or fascia lata or a vicral mesh. So this is how we wrap the implant in donor sclera and then we have made these small cuts to implant the, in, in the extraocular muscles, the medial superior and the inferior and the lateral rectus or we can make a small vicral mesh which is wrapped all around the implant and to this the muscles can be attached. Porous polythene is slightly better than hydroxyapatite. It allows fibrovascular in growth. It is smoother than hydroxyapatite and therefore it is easier to implant. There is no need of wrapping materials and the extraocular muscles can be attached directly through the implant. The cost is also very low and there are various shapes which can be available. So we have different shapes with these grooves for the extraocular muscles which can be used or small markings for the extraocular muscle attachments. But again, one of the problems that we face in these bio implants is the problem of high cost, the high risk of exposure and the high risk of infection. So unless you do a pegging, that is you actually make a hole in the implant, put a screw and then attach the process to it, there's no added advantage over a PMMA implant. Again, problems like discharge, extrusion and pyogenic granuloma can occur with these special uh, the hydroxyapatite and the porous polythene implants and therefore PMMA still remains the most common kind of implant. Now the, uh, these were the uh, autologous implants. Now let's talk about the dermis fat grafts which is an uh, which comes from the body itself. So uh, here what we use is the dermis and the fat underneath. So we remove the epidermis by removing uh, by injecting usually some local anesthetic creating a pudy orange appearance and removing this the superficial epidermis and we just use the dermis and the fat. Now the advantage is that this is a living implant and we can use it both for as a primary implant or we can use it as a secondary implant especially in case of children. So when should we use a dermis fat graft? So in a child who has got both volume and surface loss we can use a dermis fat graft. If there are failed multiple socket surgeries we can use a dermis fat graft or if it is a very difficult socket or a post enucleation socket syndrome where you want to possibly give a lot of fat here on the top you can use a dermis fat graft. Or a chronically exposed implant can be covered by a dermis fat graft because that is going to vascularize very fast and it is going to heal very well. Or post trauma there is a chemical injury we can definitely use a dermis fat graft. Or congenital anophthalmos we can also use this. One of the other options is to use a hydrogel socket expander. So this is a hydrogel socket expander. This is usually for the socket and there is a separate one for the orbit as well. And these we suture inside the socket between the two lids and this can be used to expand. So when you, we put water on hydrogel then it's going to expand in size and therefore it will expand the orbit and assume a large size. So that is about what material to implant and next is what size to implant. So if you use an undersized implant you'll have a smaller eye or a deep superior sulcus which is this deformity. So it's a deep superior sulcus on the top which you see. So once you put an undersized implant this problem is going to happen and you can always not have a very uh, large processes. So there are different types of rules which we follow about the size of the implant. So the implant should be at least 70 to 80 percent of the volume of the orbit which is actually very difficult to achieve in real life and the process should maybe about 30 percent of the volume of the uh, replacement. But the important uh, technique that which we can follow easily is to subtract from the axial length 2 millimeters and use it as the implant diameter. In addition, uh, for evisceration, we can subtract another one millimeter, or uh, and again one millimeter for hyperopia because you're going to tighten the muscles. So ideally, in an enucleation, you can do axial length minus two millimeters, and for an evisceration, you can do axial length minus four millimeters. If you don't have a proper or you have a very thysical eye, then maybe you can do an axial length of the normal eye and then try to match the other eye because our main purpose is to have symmetry between the two eyes. So different techniques which uh, Dr. Vikas has already mentioned and discussed. 
So here you can see that implant can be of different sizes and if it is a smaller implant you'll have a you'll have to have a larger process and this becomes very heavy and eventually it will displace downwards. So about sizing the implant it is very clear about what size and how do we calculate the size. Now where to implant? Ideally we'd like to implant it in the posterior tenon space that is once we remove the optic nerve we want to get inside and put it in the posterior tenon space because that is the place where it is least likely to displace. If you if you can, if possible, one can always use a small implant placing uh, instruments which we can use to put the implant deep inside. In evisceration, it's pretty easy because you're going to put it inside the scleral cup, so it is not a problem at all. So in conclusion, if there is a staphyloma, possibly we would like to do an evisceration with a PMM implant. If there is a thysis bulbi, then we would like to do a modified evisceration, that is a four petal evisceration with PMM implants. Enucleation, we can consider porous implant if you're going to plan for pegging. But if you're not planning for pegging, then best is to go for a PMM implant. Now for enucleation, for tumors, ideally we'd like to go for a PMM implant because we're never going to plan for a pegging. And if it's an irradiated socket or a difficult socket, you can always think of doing a dermis fat graft. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? I now invite uh, Dr. Nitin Vichare and he will talk to us about contracted socket and the problems of contracted socket and how to manage them. Good afternoon everybody. And uh, thanks for this opportunity provided by the AYS and our chief instructor, Dr. Ramesh Murthy. Uh, socket management of a, uh, a socket and basically for management of a contracted socket is sometimes a topic which general ophthalmologist doesn't like to touch. A patient who has got an injury uh, or a small child with irradiated socket or somebody who has got undergone multiple enucleation there is a uh, co socket contraction which takes place and when the patient generally report, uh, reports to a general ophthalmologist, the uh, uh, not much can be offered by the general ophthalmologist thinking that it's very difficult surgery and he will not be able to handle the case. And such patients are then referred uh, for the higher centers but without trying to go for their own uh, surgical intervention. What today I am trying to uh, take a topic is in the socket anomalies. When you get a patient of contracted socket which we generally get post trauma, post blast injury, uh, it, we can actually go for a management of a contracted circuit and uh, uh, the aim is to transfer the knowledge or the skill that the contracted circuit can be handled. If you see the socket contractions and uh, the historical perspectives, the, uh, the recorded enucleation which was done in historical aspects which was followed by the uh, formation of granulation tissue and a secondary healing, so that le uh, led to the contraction. Uh, the first uh, uh, breakthrough was to use for the implant to cover the orbital uh, volume loss, and that has uh, got the uh, semi. And uh, there were multiple which had come costovejo integrated, which where you can tie the uh, uh, muscles upper and down. But uh, Mule's implant has uh, stood the test of time. So when you get a, uh, an ophthalmic socket post enucleation or post uh, trauma, what you should look for the satisfactory or the acceptable socket should be. It should be able to hold a central implant, adequately lined epithelium, eyelid should be having the normal appearance and when you put the artificial prosthesis, it should give the good cosmetic appearance. So when, so why this contracted socket do happen? Because uh, after surgery when you are handling the tissues, there are so many changes and challenges which took place. First, firstly, there is a once you remove the eyeball or there is a uh, injury and a loss of the content, there is a loss of volume deficit and also with the volume deficit the gravity take uh, comes into play and there is a dropping of the LPS SR complex. So this uh, causes the tissues to move centrally and posteriorly. So this leads to the uh, contraction of the tissues. So along with that the inferior rectus, uh, since there is no eyeball, it tends to rise, post, uh, there is a Counterclockwise rotation of the orbital contents, fat is then collected inferiorly and orbital undergo, orbital contents undergo progressive atrophic changes. 
So the first thing is to prevent the contact to socket. If the surgery is planned, like the planned enucleation, there should be uh, thinking in the uh, surgeon's mind that how do we are going to handle that socket uh, during the surgery and immediately after surgery. So you should uh, have the planning in place, handle the tissues, basically conjunctiva and tendons, uh, uh, thoughtfully. Uh, excessive dissection as well as uh, excision of conjunctiva and tendons is not to be done. Uh, implant should be of adequate size and uh, the confirmer should be placed at the end of the surgery to maintain the phonesis. As uh, Sarja has already told, the implant you should decide on the before the surgery what size of implant you are going to put or there are many which we can buy there is a implant sizers which we can where there are uh, different sizes of implants are put over the stock so that you can check on the table which is going to be uh, adequate size and it will be uh, sutured without any contraction. So when you there is a socket contracture takes place you can uh, you should find out what uh, and uh, identify the uh, causes. So early cause is basically as I said the surgery or it can be during the postoperative period poor fitting prosthesis. Late causes, this can be chronic infection, inflammation, migration of the or extrusion of the implant, multiple socket surgeries because of there is any uh, trauma or a loss of some uh, bone or foreign body is there. Even the uh, uh, prosthesis which are going to put into the sulcus, if it is has the sharp edges, it can incite the reaction. So once you get a patient of contracted socket, you can look what you can be do. First, uh, decide what type of contracted socket you are handling. There, there is a Gopal Krishna uh, classification which is well accepted and it's very easy to remember. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 where basically shortening of the inferior phonics which comes early. As I said, there is a uh, movement of the tissues and inferior rises. So it can be then happen in the both phonics. Grade 3 is all four phonics are shorted. And there can be in grade 4, there is a horizontal palpable aperture is then reduced. Grade 5 basically uh, what we call as malignant uh, contracture where there is a repeated uh, surgeries have been done, but contracted socket has not been eliminated. So, what are the uh, problems? Main feature is basically what we have to correct is superior sulcus deformity, inophthalmos, where basically the implant is of not adequate size. If along with the orbital fat content which is undergoing uh, uh, orbital fat which has atrophied, it causes the uh, loss of uh, tissues as well as loss of uh, support to the LPS uh, SR complex and there is a ptosis and there can be rarely entropy one can be there. So th this is what the how you see that uh, implant is uh, there a processes has been put but over a period of time there is a superior sulcus deformity because of the uh, loss of orbital fat and other contents have taken place. So it because basically requires uh, adequate volume replacement and uh, if requ uh, required you can replace the orbital fat with the uh, uh, in, uh, injection of the uh, tissues. Then do drop socket appearance basically along with the as I said when there is a of, uh, loss of the tissues uh, uh, especially orbital fat uh, the uh, uh, artificial processes tends to sell, sell, uh, or tends to go down because of the as the uh, implant moves posteriorly and there is a migration of the implant the ar artificial processes uh, there is a inferior displacement of the uh, prosthesis. So as, uh, as you can see in these cases the left eye there was a prosthesis which are over a period of time the prosthesis has been sunken it has come down compared to the other eye. So this requires the replacement of the volume or even the uh, replacement of the uh, implant which is there many times the implant is migrated you can you have to find out why the implant has been migrated correct that factor and correct the uh, uh, inferior and superior furnace that will give the adequate uh, cosmetic correction. If there is a ptosis, uh, this needs to be corre uh, corrected, it, but it is to be corrected at the end of the uh, volume replacement. So how do you uh, manage the contacted socket? First you replace the volume as uh, previous speaker also has said, you need to check which type of implant, how much size of implant, whether it requires any change in the implant size. Uh, also, you do the lower lid tightening, do the tassel strip procedure or facial sling that will give the adequate inferior phonix and there is a correction of the ptosis. Size of implant as has already been covered, but the, what type of implant which are you going to put 
I still feel, and every uh, uh, it is a it is open to debate. The best implant is still the mule's implant, which has the least complications, including infection, extrusion, or uh, 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 what we call as uh, under or uh, migration do occur, but it can infection is definitely less. Non-integrated implant like made for implant requires uh, a covering, and that causes the difficulties to during the surgery. Orbital floor implant, this is the another thing, when you say the orbital volume replacement is less, it requires a cover, you need to check what is the cause for the contracted socket or the socket which is having the less or the uh, less uh, volume. Uh, CT scan to be done, many times there is a orbital floor fracture uh, along with the previous surgery, as you can see inferiorly here, and that needs to be covered along with a orbital floor implant that will uh, raise the uh, uh, mule's implant to the proper size. Volume augmentation of the fat can be done. It can be autologous fat uh, which can be uh, harvested from the own uh, patient that can be, uh, this fat can be injected uh, behind the implant that will uh, uh, cover the volume loss. As you can see in this patient, as I had shown the uh, uh, picture pre previously where there was a dropped socket appearance, we have injected uh, uh, autologous fat to cover the volume loss. Other things which can be used are collagen, hyaluronic acid uh, or some other artificial metals, but the best is fat uh, is which is easily harvestable, there is no rejection, there is no galvanization tissue which forms after the fat injection. Inferior phonics, if it is required, needs to be uh, uh, fixed with the phonics formation suture. Process needs to be corrected. And uh, problems associated with implant, which are there, which are, which are the reason for the contracted socket, needs to be uh, looked into. Uh, the best implant for a patient person to start with the, uh, after the enucleation or EVCR surgery or when we want to go for the orbital volume replacement is Mule's implant. Uh, what can be done uh, in a small exposure of a such implant which is there, it started coming out. You can observe large exposures and frank ex extrusions will be removed and replaced. What I am going to cover is next is surface uh, reconstruction. Surface reconstruction is the next part of the socket contraction. When there is a grade 3 or grade 4 socket, then you needs to surface, uh, needs to be augmented when there is no volume loss is not there. Mucous membrane grafting to be taken, lower lid mucosa is easily available. Uh, surgical technique uh, needs uh, that uh, that you harvest the mucosa from the lower lip, uh, then that uh, need that can be used to cover the defect provided after uh, making the inferior phonix suture. Uh, you can go for the multi-stage mucous membrane grafting, may not uh, get a uh, uh, adequate size inferior phonix in first go, you can go for the repeat mucous membrane grafting. Uh, it's a relatively easy technique of mucous membrane grafting can give you the good uh, uh, inferior phonics and adequately uh, fitting customized processes. So these are the few cases what we had done grade 3, grade 4 process uh, 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 contract socket with a surface reconstruction with mucous membrane grafting and customized processes has been given. DFG, uh, I will just touch upon the DFG when grade, grade 4 or grade 5 contract socket, the uh, first thing is to go for the, uh, well the uh, first option is to uh, for the dummy fat graft, and uh, but the thing is that it uh, it requires uh, that socket should have a good vascular supply. In irradiated socket, uh, DFG generally doesn't help. Uh, elliptical graft to be harvested, and it should be at least 25 to 30 percent more graft is harvested from the gluteal region, upper outer quadrant, and uh, the surgical technique is difficult to master. This uh, because of paucity of time, I have not covered the DFG in here. There is uh, just for a few slides what can be done in a malignant socket contracture. When we are saying the grade 5 socket contracture, these uh, so uh, con uh, sockets are not amenable to the surgical correction. When the person has undergone 3 or 4 or 5 surgeries uh, previously, implant uh, is not being uh, placed or implant is not uh, in, uh, you are not able to place the implant or it can be irradiated socket, you can go for the spectacle based uh, cosmetic correction. For before that, before you give the spectacle be, uh, base uh, correction, this person is having a watering, discharge and other problems that needs to be addressed to. Uh, you go need to uh, 
close the lids before the closing the lids you need to ablate and remove the lacrimal gland to avoid the excessive watering and then uh, you can customize the uh, spectacle breast prosthesis and give it it so to conclude contracted socket is uh, not uh, a thing to be uh, afraid of you need to plan a surgery if it is a planned surgery like enucleation innovation see how you are going to handle the tissues that will uh, decrease the complications if you get a contracted socket which has been previously uh, because of your own surgery has been uh, referred to you uh, examine the patient find out what type of which which grade of contracted socket 1 2 3 4 5 with whether it requires uh, orbital volume replacement or only it requires the surface reconstruction if it is volume replacement you go for the volume replacement first and surface reconstruction in second or third surgery multiple stage mucous membrane grafting will be helpful or it is easy to do and it you can definitely do mucous membrane grafting and if it is uh, difficult and it is beyond uh, your uh, beyond corrections so contract socket you can go for the cosmetic appearance based is uh, spectacle based prosthesis thank you thank you dr nitin are there any questions from the audience No, I have not tried, but I have given uh, amniotic membrane along with the mucous membrane grafting. Yeah. It's not amniochorionic. Uh, when we are giving the mucous membrane grafting, I had uh, one of the pictures, if you see there is an amniotic membrane also lying there. So when you do the inferior fornix and your central area, which you are covered with the uh, mucous membrane graft, if it is still, it is a bigger one, rather than trying to reduce the surface, you cover the remaining part with the uh, amniotic membrane. So it gives the better uh, surface reconstruction. Amniot amniochorionic graft I have not done. It's, it's painful, but easy to harvest. It is easy to harvest. Easy to harvest. Uh, oh, okay. huh? Huh, if it is if if suture it is not painful. I, what I have done, even I had presented a paper also today, uh, contracted socket, uh, the five or uh, seven cases in last four, uh, three years. I have done repeated mucous membrane grafting and I have it from the same uh, same site, lower lip mucosa. If the dissection is good, if you have not cut the muscle, lip muscle, or uh, if you have not gone deep into, this, uh, the mucous membrane which uh, regrows, you can harvest it again after six weeks to eight weeks. So multiple, well that's why I put a slide of multiple mucous membrane grafting that I have presented a paper on that. So, thank thank you. you, Dr. Nitin. I now invite Dr. Himika to speak on a topic on challenges in mucormycosis. Just out of interest in the audience, how many of you are actually doing a lot of uh, these socket surgeries? So you must be facing complications like contracted socket. Madam, if there is a lot of socket contracture and if you feel that there is a lot of superior circles deformity, we can do two things. One and is to... Sockets have not actually uh, grown up and it was already uh, initiated in childhood. Then, madam, we have to... If it is a bony contracture, we should not do much. But soft tissue, definitely we can use dermis fat or mucous membrane or any graft. And then we can put a good customized process for giving good uh, cosmesis. We can do that later in life. We can all we have to co cover both the surface contracture by using mucous membrane graft and the volume deficit by maybe using a dermis fat graft, and that will really help. We have to do little extensive surgery, but it can be managed with a good custom processes. Uh, Dr. Himika, please. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, AIOS and Dr. Ramesh Murthy, uh, for this opportunity. I would like to acknowledge my current and past institutes where some of the patient photos are. Today we'll be discussing the challenges that we faced when we handled orbital mucormycosis sockets. So post-COVID mucor was a bolt out of the blue. We ophthalmologists have a, generally have a good night's sleep and we were suddenly made to live a life of obstetricians. Yes, it was a bold out of the blue. Those of us who went through that, I think many of us, who all did night duties during COVID, who all had sleepless nights during COVID, yeah. Uh, 
yes so yeah you can relate to that okay so with that background we'll just go through three cases case examples on what happened with the sockets of such muca patients the first one is a happy ending one lid sparing excentration with a happy ending we call it this is what we faced around last year this time during the second wave of this pandemic 45 year old male who had a covid induced impaired glycemic control and a diagnosis of rhino orbital muca one round of endonasal clearance or nasal debridement done and a lot of uh, residual disease in pns and in the paranasal sinuses and the orbit he had ptosis proptosis chemosis restricted ocular motility he had no perception of light due to central retinal artery occlusion and we gave him a trial of three injections of transorbital uh, amphotericin b and still there was no change it was status quo so he was taken up for orbital excentration with endonasal clearance and pns clearance so here what we like to call it is a uh, a truly lid sparing orbital excentration we did a lateral canthotomy then we did a 360 degree peritomy where we tried to save the conjunctiva subconjunctival tissue as well as the fornices the superior and inferior fornix and then we reached the lower orbital rim just like we tried to do a trans conjunctival uh, approach to the floor of orbit of floor fractures and from there we started to excentrate so if i were to use this very famous you know diagram which describes what is excentration and if i were to recreate the lids there are various ways in which we excentrate for example if we have a extensive uh, cancer involving the eyelid and orbit we would take off both the eyelids perhaps depending on the extent and of course the entire orbital tissue uh, along the periorbita al along with the periorbita or the periosteum the second option is what we call the lid split evisceration where at the gray line or at the junction of anterior and posterior lamella we split the lid and the uh, right up to the orbital rim again we reach the orbital rim the bony orbit and we basically conserve the anterior skin orbicularis or the anterior lamella of the lid which is utilized to line the socket and we take away all this part which has been outlined in blue including the posterior lamella now in the current case what we did is we left the eyelid in toto the anterior and the posterior lamella along with some subconjunctival tissue some inferior lid retractors we took and and some amount of conjunctiva also we left it behind and we could take that liberty because mucor is a posterior disease most of us who did mucor work know that it was the apex which had most of the disease actually the poor conjunctiva and the muscle attachments did, didn't really have mucor at least the cases that we i'm going to show here they didn't have anything in the anterior orbit so this is the image of that patient where here you can see that you know we have left behind the anterior and posterior the entire upper lid and the lower lid both lamellae and then when we reach the rim we start dissecting like we try to expose the floor of the um, uh, uh, floor of orbit in a flow fracture and go backwards and then we took the entire specimen out this is a lateral canthotomy obviously for better exposure and this is one week post op where at the end of the procedure we take some loose sutures with uh, suturing the upper and lower subconjunctival tissue and the conjunctiva layered closure using 60 vicryl we don't make it too tight because we expect despite achieving hemostasis some amount of ooze even the lateral canthotomy is not very tight we encourage some amount of ooze and in some patients we also put a drain and here and on table we do put a conformer so this patient was like a happy ending patient this is how he looked at the end of 6 months the conformer was retained and the entire socket was lined by conjunctiva so it was a wet socket and we had eyelids those of us who try to rehabilitate excentrated sockets we know that recreating eyelids 
getting a cost effective silicon prosthesis and a plastologist can be very challenging so in this case we got away with not having to go through those steps what we used was a two part magnetic custom prosthesis i acknowledge my ocularist colleague for the same so this is the two part prosthesis that you can see the back part is heat cured pmma acrylic with a magnet and the front part is almost like a custom made prosthesis that we give for uh, at the end of enucleation or evisceration so this part is put in first and with capillary action and these small magnets these are we uh, we impregnate magnets in these and with that the front part sits on it so the final outcome was something like this and the patient was quite happy and we were also pretty happy with this this is a two part prosthesis if we try to put in a single prosthesis in one go it becomes very heavy so that is one of the reasons uh, we prefer a two part prosthesis prosthesis so this uh, this type of surgery helped us to get away with a acrylic prosthesis in a case of excentration and it was truly a happy ending but then all stories cannot be happy so i'll go ahead with my uh, talk on that the lesson that we learnt in this challenge is that tissue conservation can give us rewarding cosmesis and we could get away with the ocular prosthesis in a excentrated patient so with that enthusiasm we went on with our case 2 where we did again the lid sparing excentration that i just showed um, to get a dream socket what i started calling it but then there was some trouble So this is the next case of Muker, who was a 57-year-old known diabetic post-COVID infection, ROCM, rhinoorbitocerebral Muker. As you can see, already one round of nasal debridement done, pretty nicely with PNS uh, and maxilla cleared, but the orbit was untouched. We gave all these patients trials of two to three or maybe four rounds of orbital amphotericin B and. after uh, seeing worsening uh, that's when they were excentrated again this patient had a frozen orbit and no perception of light so we did the same thing we did a lid sparing we spare we did lateral canthotomy spared anterior and posterior lamella some amount of conjunctiva fornix and subconjunctival tissue we were able to put a conformer and it was retained well in the fornix however at 2 months he presented with what we thought was cellulitis he said because they could not always travel because those times somebody was positive somebody in the family was in quarantine so on and so forth so our follow up schedules were a bit staggered so he said that it's there is a lot of redness and my sugars are in uh, control is impaired so we will we thought maybe it's cellulitis but when i saw him there was roplas was positive and in fact he had somewhere the lacrimal sac got left behind so he actually had a pio seal so in attempting to do a beautiful socket we missed out on the lacrimal sac so over enthusiasm to conserve the anterior tissue led us to overlook the lacrimal sac clearance he then had to undergo a endonasal dcr and uh, well i can't call it a dcr because there was no bone it was just a puncture that we could do endonasally but yeah we did a clearance and later on after antibiotics and this drainage he is doing good and now he is due for his uh, prosthesis the socket was well maintained but the lesson that i learned is never ignore the lacrimal sac even in excentration so in cataract we are very enthu what is the sac what is the sac but even in excentration we should remember it can cause troublesome socket infections uh, at this point i wanted to almost rebuke myself because a similar case was referred to us and we have already published this sac infections in lacrimal um, uh, lacrimal sac infections in, uh, causing very bad excentration socket problems and this was way back in 2017 so i was sort of reminded of my follies anyways uh, with that taste in our mind about being more careful of lacrimal sac we go ahead with the third case which was a lid sparing excentration again i wanted it to be a dream socket but well let's see so she was a 61 year old she was a known case of diabetic ketoacidosis and rocm okay and nasal debridement again done and we again did our so called lid sparing excentration where we try to save both anterior and posterior lamella like this but as you can see here the skin is now sticking back to the bone so what had happened in this case is that the 
the bony orbit and PNS was so badly involved. In fact, she was a case where we had to take death on table consent when he took when we took her for surgery. The roof of mouth was resected. Medial walls were absent. Each time we tried to put the conformer on table or post op, the conformer will would fall into the oral cavity. Moreover, she had a secondary bacterial infection. And slowly, there was no place to put a conformer and the skin was sticking on to the orbital, bony orbital walls. So the uh, over enthusiast that I am, we decided to try something new, which was a threaded conformer technique. And this did help to quite an extent. We took fornix formation sutures after dissecting the tissue and using uh, the mucous membrane graft, which is obviously the most versatile graft in these cases. But over and above that, because we had a blind socket, which was not only not even lined with the orbital bones, it was directly connected to the pharynx. So we didn't want the prosthesis or the, uh, or the conformer falling into the nose or, or mouth or worse getting aspirated. We threaded the conformer and then made fornix formation sutures. So this is the diagram, which is the intro diagram. We put after dissecting and uh, lining the posterior uh, eyelid with mucous membrane, we took fornix formation sutures, which were oblique, which went through the conformer, through the fornix and came out onto the periosteum over here. And in this way, we deepened the fornix as well as kept the conformer in place so that the socket could get its volume and shape. So far, so good. We felt very proud and we thought that we can again go ahead with the custom made ocular prosthesis. However, this was not a straight one because as you can see, she didn't have a roof of mouth. This is the uh, artificial uh, roof of mouth or the plate that she had with the artificial tooth. In that, we attached a magnet after that we started doing a wax up of a connector with two magnets and we came up with a three part prosthesis connecting to the roof of the mouth so we reached as far as this where one part was on the one part was attached to the uh, roof of the mouth here and the other end came out to the orbit and then we had a clear acrylic custom conformer however when we were doing the trial on one of the occasions the eye or the custom conformer fell into the mouth and our heart was in our mouth because we were very scared that this could get aspirated and it could get super dangerous. So because safety is most important, we decided to call it a day. We cannot compromise on safety just for, you know, looks. So we decided to then go ahead and she's now being worked up for a eccentrated prosthesis and we've ad abandoned all attempts to try to utilize the beautiful eyelids that i was able to save in this case and so Dr. the le how do you like to conclude yeah. yeah so the lesson that we learned in this is that we cannot compromise on safety and whenever we approach any socket whether mucor socket or any kind of eccentration or enucleation socket one size or one technique doesn't fit all Every patient might need something new. The two-part magnetic custom prosthesis works in certain cases and it helps us to get very good results in a case of eccentration uh, without having to go in for a silicon prosthesis. And we must not forget the retained lacrimal sac. It can cause troublesome socket infections. Extensive resections around the orbit and paranasal sinus may dictate the choice of prosthesis and the type of surgery. Thank you very much for a patient listening. Any questions? So this is the last talk of this uh, instruction course and it is about custom ocular processes, the final frontier. So that Ideally, yes, ma'am. But the cases of mucor, they had so many other systemic problems that by the time they were otherwise healthy to make a visit to the lab, it was invariably six months. So th Six months. No. 
there wa- there was no need for a biopsy because we had exenterated and we were watching the patient carefully with repeat mris and yeah all of them had all of them all cases were taken in ot with the e- yeah ENT and me, yeah. Yes. We were following up. We were following up the other. There were, if there was an indication, we would do the biopsy. But in this case, it was not needed because many of them, it is the clinical evaluation, and generally these patients were managed in the institute. So the entire team, there was a uh, orbital mucomycosis task force. So as per the rules and regulations of that, we had an infectious disease specialist, a microbiologist, uh, ENT team, and from orbit I was there, and general medicine, and obviously the endocrinologist. These all people, we were managing it jointly. Uh, Amphotericin, correct. And the next six months is Pusakulam. Correct. Yes, yes. In the meantime, if the patient is weaker, we should observe the effect of the But we were doing MRIs and we were not, uh, yeah. so there was no reason we thought to, to do biopsies. Don't, don't mind, but I think we should continue with this Outside. talk. Uh, so we'll continue with this talk on custom ocular process, which is the final frontier. I'd like to acknowledge the oculars who, have, uh, who are working with Axisai Clinic. So when we have a patient who's one-eyed, we have to look at the patient with both sympathy and empathy. And uh, giving them a poorly fitting process is not the ideal thing and we want to give them a good process which makes them look as normal as possible. So many times you have patients who come with uh, these kind of process that is a stock eye and they may have other problems like severe inflammation, severe pain and even these kind of uh, dis- disfigured process may be uh, used by the patient. So the best solution for these cases is to use a custom ocular processes. The problems of stock eye is that there is poor cosmosis, poor biocompatibility. Biocompat- it will destroy the socket anatomy and modifications are not possible. But on the contrary, cost- custom ocular process is made by the ocularist and they try to match the other eye. It gives a lifelike appearance. It is uh, always able to do some modifications and it maintains the socket anatomy. So what we do is we put in a little bit of PMMA, try to make a f- uh, imprint of this particular socket and then we can make a wax model out of it and then transform this and then we do the iris painting and then finally implant it into the PMMA, white PMMA and do a polishing and finally we coat it with uh, transparent acrylic to give this kind of clear appearance. So there are different kinds of patients that we may face. So this is a patient who's got an ill-fitting process which is uh, usually a, uh, a stock eye and you can see that there is a crack in the stock eye and this has led to this kind of severe inflammation. So these patients definitely we should go for a custom process for good uh, cosmesis. Sometimes you'll have patients with smaller implants and then they put an implant and this starts extruding out. There's a lot of infection. So here again, uh, you end up removing the implant. You may not be able to place a better implant. So a custom process might be an answer where you may not be able to place a second implant. Sometimes there are severe similar front cases where repeated surgeries may not be indicated or the patient may not be willing for repeated surgeries. So what we do in these cases is we put the process with a small notch for this particular semblephron. So it's pretty well and it fits very uh, snugly and does not fall out of the eye. And sometimes you have these kind of patients who had severe chemical injuries and there is a lot of surface deficit, volume deficit, multiple surgeries have been undergone by the patient and you find it difficult to convince them for further surgery. There is a lot of uh, socket contracture with both fornics, inferior and superior fornics. And in these cases, again, uh, custom ocular process would be the better better answer. Mild microphthalmos, as you can see here, uh, it's very easy to manage this by placing a nice uh, process on top of the original eye without doing any kind of surgery. If there's moderate microphthalmos, we can even use custom-made conformers initially, initially of smaller sizes, and then you keep on increasing the size of the conformer, and finally one can place a good-sized artificial eye, even in a very severe socket contracture. In severe microphthalmos, what we do is we place these kind of process and uh, you can see that they have got these small extensions and on this we place a tape. And because of this tape, it is fit snugly uh, over the uh, uh, socket and that leads to socket expansion and finally we can put a small artificial eye inside and over time this will going, going to expand as the child grows and then we can avoid unnecessary surgery and we can expand this as time goes by. In complicated cases like cryptophthalmos where there is, uh, you can see there's a lot of problems like there's absence of the eyebrow, 
you can see there is a problem of medial upper eyelid on the even on the other normal side there is a little bit of semilithron here and here you can see that it is a total cryptophthalmos totally hidden eye we can definitely try these case also so here what we have done is we have opened up the socket where we want to create the eye we have lined it with both uh, lots of mucous membrane and amniotic membrane and we have sutured uh, we also put a skin graft on top to create the socket and this is the conformer inside and over time it heals and here we have tried to fabricate the uh, custom made process this is the wax model we have tried to give as much centering as possible and finally we are man able to manage with a decent size process of course there is not much of eyelid movement but the patient looks pretty okay I will not say it is 100% cosmetic but this was a very difficult case which we managed successfully so even in these cases a combination of surgery and process is very helpful to uh, rehabilitate the patient if there is a small uh, socket and you have a superior sulcus deformity you can make a small wedge on the implant of clear PMMA or clear acrylic and this can help in masquerading the superior sulcus deformity post traumatic cases are very difficult and many times we end up doing multiple surgeries like this is an inferior phonix sutures to form the phonics and finally we will be able to give a decent size of process for the patient <coughs> this is congenital anophthalmia with the dermoid so we do an extensive surgery we also try to uh, try to repair the lids so we can always continue we can always combine lid surgeries along with the processes so that we can give a good cosmos to the patient so overall the main aim here is to rehabilitate the patient make them as normal as possible so they can face the society confidently in microphthalmos case again we can put a nice processes and uh, as you can see here it's a pretty good process it's a good moment of the processes and a near normal appearance so process moment is also possible provided that we have done a good fitting or good uh, measurement of the socket when we put in the PMMA implant this is a magnetic two piece process this lady was actually a gynecologist who was working in rural Maharashtra and this was a stone which she had placed inside there and on top of it she was using a stock eye so what we did and this is a very bony dry socket as you can see so surgery is not a good answer here so what we have done is we have made up two uh, part process one on the other side is this the inner part which has got this magnet and this is uh, the outer part which is again got a magnet so these are neodymium yttrium boron magnets which can be used so just because this particular uh, two part process is it is giving a lot of stability to the socket and we have also painted the socket a little bit to make it look more normal to good cosmos to the patient so custom ocular process is the answer for all these cases so irrespective of how good your surgery is finally it is the cosmesis which is going to be given by the customized ocular processes so it is we have to look for good cosmesis good process retention good motility and it should also be comfortable to the patient so if possible and if the patient can afford we'd always like to encourage the patient to go for a custom ocular processes thank you for your attention if there are any questions we are happy to take any questions when it is occurred usually we try to uh, try to avoid surgery if it is possible and like these kind of modifications we can do with the processes so we can use magnetic two part process or we can do a customized processes which is fitting well or we can do a uh, spectacle based process or a stick on processes so various methods we use or sometimes uh, we try to fix it to the orbital socket uh, orbit rather than to the socket sir i had a doubt in uh, the two piece prosthesis for the patient uh, some of our cases are now telling that the magnets have caught rust and they are not working. That is a problem. That we yeah, the, these magnets are made of neodymium, yttrium and boron and they are extremely powerful magnets. The problem is that the magnetic quality is going to last for 4 to 5 years. Okay. After which the magnetic uh, property will be lost. So in which case you have to go ahead with a new process. That is unavoidable. But nevertheless it's a very good option because you are not doing any surgery and you are able to rehabilitate the patient very easily and very successfully. Because it's a very powerful magnet it doesn't fall. So we have to go ahead with the new process and replace the magnets. Thank you, sir. Are there any effects of magnets also around? No, madam. Uh, so we have, I have, I have done a lot of, uh, we have done quite a few cases and we published also this for the first time in the world, the use of magnetic processes. So these new dimming processes are very uh, safe for the orbit and for these tissues. I have read a lot of papers on this and we've also used it for excentration also, these magnets. So it is safe for, th for the body. The magnetic effect or the radiation effect is very minimal to the surrounding structures.
so i would like to thank the audience for being very interactive and very supportive and also my speakers uh, dr kanan nitilchare sir himika gupta madam and vikas menon sir for their wonderful contribution i invite uh, our next session it's thank going to be an interesting session on cosmetic surgeries yes ma'am Yeah, yeah. No, you can't remove it. You have to just tell the MRI people that it's very difficult to do an MRI. You can't remove it. Very. If you fix it to the skin, you can't remove every time. But if it is a uh, free process like we showed, it can be removed easily. Yeah.